don't know if you've noticed this, but we live in a culture that is obsessed with safety. Have you noticed this? Everywhere you look, there's some sort of warning sign, some sort of thing. I was a very small child when I first became aware of this. I think it was 1985. I looked up the, the date on the internet. Uh, but North Carolina did something in 1985 that was quite controversial at the time involving safety. A lot of you might remember this. They made it a law that you had to wear a seatbelt in your car if you were sitting in the front seat. Eventually now back seat people have to wear seatbelts. And I remember people being so upset about like that. I remember being at church one day and then a grown man saying, this is an infringement on my constitutional rights. And I'm like, man, what's in the constitution? I don't think I understand the constitution. But people were upset because people, were, you can't legislate safety. I've heard that phrase before. And so it was a big deal. Uh, you know what? These were simpler times. Like if I wanted to get on my bicycle and ride down a big hill and fall off my bicycle and bust my brain open, that was my constitutional right. Now there's rules. You have to wear, I don't know, helmets and elbow pads and knee pads if you're a kid. And so uh, just anecdotally, some of you remember, uh, we used to have these things called playgrounds that were actually just death traps for children. Do you remember? old playgrounds like I remember they they had these like 12 foot slides and they built them out of metal that was the most reflective and heat absorbing metal in the world and it would give you second degree burns on your little legs and there were no rails on this thing it was a 12 foot a-frame ladder and you climb up and if you fall off you'll be a stronger person uh you remember seesaws you try to find me a seesaw in a public play playground right now. You won't. I've been looking for them. Uh, they have one at PT's Grill down at Monkey Junction because they don't care about safety. But it's, it, it's like, you know, a 300-pound chunk of metal, and you put like a splintery seat on each end. And the game is you, you get your kid, you get your friend like eight feet in the air, and then you try to bail on them and see if you can break their tailbone. Like that is how you use a seesaw. At least that's how we did it. Remember merry-go-rounds? Ain't nothing like getting drug around by a merry-go-round, big old iron wheel of death. Um, in my high school, we were obsessed with safety, but this is not the way it used to be. And my high school had a smoking area for the students. Did any of your high schools have that? Absolutely. Yeah, it's my right. You know, once I can buy cigarettes, I can smoke. Um, now they have to hide in the bathrooms and vape. But we used to have a public area where we would just, I, I, I didn't smoke uh, at school. Um, but you were, you were allowed to. Things have changed. My, how the pendulum has shifted. Everything's bubble wrapped now. There are warning signs and labels and rails on everything. You can't buy a cup of hot coffee without someone warning you that you might die if you spill it on yourself because it's dangerous out there. And uh, I, I'm not, I'm not like, downing all the safety. I think the safety things are good. Professional football players have longer careers and longer lives now and have fewer concussions. That's really good. I think it's really good that they took a lot of the stuff that was causing cancer out of our food. Like, I think that's fantastic. I'm a really big fan of that. But the truth is this shift towards safety uh, has, has uh, shifted, I think, and, and made its way into our spiritual life. We don't want to be anywhere risky. We don't ever want to take a step towards something that might be remotely dangerous. I want to spend some time over the next three weeks talking about that. Uh, this series, as you can see from our title, is Dangerous Prayers. Um, when you pray, if you pray, and I hope that you do, and maybe this prayer, maybe this series will encourage you to pray, but when you pray, what do you talk to God about? I want to be clear. I don't think there's like a bad prayer. I think it's okay to talk to God about anything. He's your father. He wants to hear from you. But when you pray, how often are you praying for safety? I think we pray for comfort. I think we pray for safety. I think we pray for prosperity a lot. How much do we pray, Lord, just keep us safe as we travel and protect so-and-so from a storm and heal so-and-so? It's biblical, okay? We should pray for these things. But in addition to that, how much do you pray for things where you say, God, Challenge me in my faith. Push me to grow. Put me in situations where I will honor you and not just be privately comfortable myself. You see what I'm saying? There are a lot of things that we avoid praying for. There's a famous saying, uh, never pray for patience. You ever said that? Why wouldn't you pay, pray for patience? Like, do you realize patience is one of the most godly virtues you can develop? 
Well, we don't want to pray for patience because we know that to develop patience, I will need to practice patience. And to practice patience, I would need to be put in circumstances in which I would need to have patience. And I don't want to put it in those circumstances, so I'm not going to pray for patience. But man, what benefit would there be if we can be more like our creator and know his patience? But we don't want to pray the risky prayer. We want to pray for safety. We want to pray for comfort. We want to pray for prosperity. We don't want to pray dangerous. So I'm going to do something painful. I'm going to do something probably unpopular. Um, But I want to challenge us to pray some bold prayers. Uh, Generally, when you talk about dangerous, like you want to avoid those things, right? Piranha infested lakes, angry people with guns. Like there's some situations that you want to avoid. So I want us to understand when I say dangerous, it is 100% transparently a gimmick, okay? This is just a word. It's a word to make us think. But when I say dangerous, what I'm talking about is risky. What I'm talking about is bold. What I'm talking about is a risk that when you take it, it's 100% worth the risk. Like some trips that you've gone on, some relationships that you've built, some investments that you've made. And the same thing can be said about dangerous prayer. Uh, we're going to talk about three dangerous prayers over the course of this series. I think there could probably be like hundreds of them. And I'm guessing like over the next few years, I might return to the dangerous prayers uh, series from time to time. Be like, let's talk about a couple more dangerous prayers. But we're going to talk about three because I think this is entry level dangerous prayer. Like if you have a hard time praying in general, like to start at dangerous prayer might be like a little bit bold. But I'm going to be honest, if you're going to go, go big or go home, let's just try it. Let's give it a shot. Let's go for it. And so today we're going to talk about something that I'll tell you in a second. Next week we're going to talk about a prayer. I think I'm going to call the prayer, this is the prayer, Lord break me. It's a dangerous prayer. The third week we'll talk about a prayer, Lord send me. And today I want to talk about this prayer, and it's something that we see in the book of Psalms. So if you've got a Bible, open it up right in the middle of your book, Psalm 139. Uh, If you need a Bible, we've got free ones at the back there. You you can take it and use it just during the service, or you can take it home with you and keep it forever if you need it. Or uh, open it up on your phone. I'll have it on the screen behind me. But Psalm 139 is a prayer from King David, and the, the summary of the whole prayer, and this is kind of our dangerous prayer this morning, is basically, Lord, search my heart. That's the prayer. Lord, search my heart. Now, why is that a dangerous prayer? Well, as we read this thing, we're going to find out that it's going to really challenge us, it's going to push us, and it's going to situate us in a position where we can truly grow. We can truly experience what God has for us in our life. So uh, Psalm 139, we're going to read the first six verses just to set us up. The prayer itself, if you'd like to get ahead, uh, is verse 23 and 24. So you can go ahead and look at that if you want to. Uh, But this is a very personal prayer for King David. Uh, The book of Psalms in the Old Testament is a collection of like uh, poetry, songs, hymns the nation of Israel used during worship, and a lot of them are attributed to King David, and we're pretty sure he wrote this one as well. And he's actually, it's like straight up worship in the first six verses. So just look at this first six verses, Psalm 139, starting in verse 1. David says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, you know when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you discern my going out, my lying down, and you are familiar with all my ways. So he's setting him up like, God, you are, you're awesome. You're awesome, God. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me, and so, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And he goes on for the next oh, 10 or 12 verses, just praising God. You're great. You're awesome. When you get to verse 19 through 22, he, he, he does some safety prayer. He prays for protection from his enemies. King David is a king. He's also a military leader. He's constantly at battle. So he's like, listen, I got these enemies. They're out to get me. Will you protect me? Will you do all this stuff? So it's fine. It's fine to pray for safety. It's fine to, fine to pray for these things. But then he gets to verse 23 and 24. So this is our passage for the day, and this is where it gets dangerous. And I just want you to read it with no commentary. Let's, let's hear it. It's right here. David says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's it. That's the prayer. Um, I did something with this prayer this week. I wrote it down on an index card because I don't want to ask you guys to do anything that I'm not willing to do. Uh, There's actually some index cards in the little packets on your seats. And I want to challenge you to write it down too because you're going to need it this week, I think. Um, Because this is... uh, I wanted to pray it, and so I tried to pray it every day. I think I did, and my challenge for myself was to pray it. There's really four lines in this prayer, and to pray it one line at a time, 
and just say, all right, God, show me something. Teach me something. Um, so if you need pens, they're in the little folders too. And there's also extra pens on the tables behind the communion tables if you want to grab one. You can do it later too if you want to. But I put it in my pocket. I prayed it. I'm going to tell you something. I was, uh, I was cognizant of it all week long. And as the week went along and I was asking God to do these things, it actually made a difference. Some decisions I made on Friday and Saturday were impacted by the decision I made on Monday to write this card down and put it in my pocket. It's a dangerous prayer, but as with all these risky things, it was worth it. And so I pray that it's something we can do together. So I, I, uh, I came across uh, a sermon by a guy in Oklahoma. You might have heard of uh, Craig Groeschel. He's an author and he's been a lot of big time like speaker, Christian guy. Um, and as he breaks down this prayer, he talks about four distinct elements of this prayer. And I think you'll see why it's a dangerous prayer as you break them down, and it's very rewarding. And so what I want to do in the time we have left is look at the four lines in this prayer and see where we can grow from this and see how if we say this dangerous prayer, it will really impact our lives and make a huge difference in a good way. And so um, there are four areas. So if you're taking notes, these would be the four things you would want to write down. Here's the first one. The first line is basically this idea. Search my heart. In fact, I would call that the summary of this whole prayer. Search my heart. What could this possibly do for me? You know, there's people in my life who know my heart. Um, they, they could probably give you, if, if, if there was like a decision to be made, and I wasn't there to tell you what my opinion was, there's a few people who could give you a good idea of what they think I would say. My wife would definitely be one of those people. She's known me for a really long time. We are obviously very close. We know a lot about each other. She, she knows my heart. Uh, my brother Jason, he was able to preach here a couple of months ago, and some of you guys got to meet Jason, or you know Jason already. He, he was one of my best friends, and he knows my heart. So like if I wasn't present to make a decision, I think that my wife or my brother could make a good decision and say, I think this is what Chris would do. Why? Because they, they know my heart. But here's the problem with that. They only know what I've been willing to show them. I would like to think I've been honest with my wife and my brother. But when it comes to anybody, even your best friends, they can only know what you're willing to show them. Your inner thoughts, the most secret, quiet, hidden places, are very difficult for other people to know. That's why this prayer invites the creator of the universe in. To open a door... And to help me evaluate my inner thoughts. Search my heart. Now here's the reality. It even said it in the beginning of this chapter we just read, chapter 139. God knows our words before we say them. He already knows our thought. But what's the difference between you looking through someone's room without their permission and you looking through someone's room with their permission? Right? So for me to invite God in to search my heart, I'm saying, listen, you have my consent to point out my brokenness to show me where I need to grow, to help me celebrate what's good, search my heart. The reason we need to ask God to search our heart is because our hearts will lead us astray. Um, I want to read you a passage from Jeremiah chapter 17, uh, 7 through 9, Jeremiah 17. And it's going to talk about our heart at the end, but at the beginning of this little section, starting at verse 7, it says, Blessed is the one who trusts the Lord, whose confidence is in him. That person will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought. It will never fail to be fruitful. That's the tree whose heart, who's letting the Lord guide them, right? That's what's going on there. But verse 9 says, but the heart is deceitful above all things. And beyond cure, who can understand it? This is poetic, okay? It's it's Old Testament prophecy. It's somewhat poetic, but the analogy is like if you're the tree and, and, and you're planted beside the stream, which is God's word and his goodness and his truth and his love and his grace, you're going to prosper. Your roots are going to go far deep so that even when there's a drought, you know, life gets hard, you're going to be okay. That's when you're planted by the Lord. But if I'm being planted by my own heart, I'm going to shrivel up and die. I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not beating myself up, I'm just aware that I am a finite being. And to plant my roots next to my own stream is foolish. So the heart is deceitful above all things. And so that's why inviting God in to search my heart. Because here's the reality, we're all going to be guided by our hearts to some degree. We have this really foolish phrase that we give people for advice. Just follow your heart. Well, the heart is deceitful. Who can cure it? But if our heart has been cultivated by God, if we've invited him in to search our heart, then suddenly, okay, I can make good decisions. You follow that? It's the first line of the four um, 
And the reason we need to invite God in to do this is because on my own, we have a problem. This is the problem. We lie. We lie. Probably the person we lie to the most is ourself. On one spectrum or the other, some of us have the problem of beating ourselves up. You're stupid, you're ugly, you're unsuccessful, you're never going to go anywhere. Some of us have the equally bad habit of building ourselves up too much. You're amazing, you're awesome, you're so beautiful, you're so talented, you're so great. But neither one of those is actually a true reflection of who we really are in our, our heart because we're just building that persona of ourselves. So inviting God in to do that is important. So we can have, a first of all, a real look at who we are. If God is searching my heart, and I'm praying this prayer every day, and I'm trying to really understand who I am, then I'm going to, I'm going to extinguish the lies that I'm telling myself. And, then, and by extension, I'm going to lie less to who? Other people in my life. I told you that my wife and my brother know me very well. We've broken down a lot of those walls over the years. I've had to be very transparent with my wife about sin in my life and struggles that I have and temptation. And before I did that, I was lying to her. I wasn't protecting her. I wasn't being a better husband. And the same thing's true with any other relationship that I have. But if I can break down those lies with myself, I can then be more honest with other people and then guess what I can do with my God? Man, I can worship with just no fear even in my brokenness, because I'm not pretending like it's not there anymore. Search my heart. So that's the first part of this prayer. Honestly, like we could probably go home, you know, okay, I can work with that. But David wrote down four lines. So we're going to look at all four of them. Search my heart. So go back to the verse. Search me, God, and know my heart. That's the first line. The second one. And test me and know my anxious thoughts. So that first one was search my heart. The second line here that I want to kind of uh, test me and know my anxious thoughts is kind of, uh, we talk about anxiety a lot in our culture, so much that I'm not sure that we really have a full understanding of what anxiety is anymore. Everything's anxious. Everything's anxiety. So I want to use a different word because I think we understand it better. The word I want to use is fear. Okay, so if like idea one is search my heart, idea two is reveal my fears. Reveal my fears. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Reveal my fears. Uh, Help me know what I'm afraid of. (laughs) What's keeping me back? Why in the world would I want to invite God to do that? That's uncomfortable. That's painful. I I already know what I'm afraid of. I don't want to just go out and like be covered in spiders or wrapped up in snakes or go to really high plate. Like what is your phobia that you deal with? Or maybe it's something more abstract than those things. But like I don't want to deal with my fears. We keep those locked away. Why would I want God to test my fears? When my daughter was like... two years old and younger, she kept being sick all the time. Sometimes sick in her stomach. Sometimes uh, she had a hard time breathing, almost like asthma. Sometimes she'd just be really stuffy and and was like, what is going on with this thing? And say, you know what we did? We went to doctors. Like, why is she doing all this? Because we're decent people. And we're like, we want to help you not be sick. And so they did something. Uh, Maybe you've had an allergy test before. It's crazy. I don't know if there's like lots of different allergy tests, but the one they did was they took little bitty injections of allergens. They put like, I don't know, 10 or 12 in her arm, just little bitty bits of it. And then they like I don't know, they had a chart, they knew which dot was which, and some of them swelled up because there was a reaction. And within, I don't know, moments, we knew that she had three food sensitivities. Boom! So guess what we did? We took those foods out of her diet. She did not like that. She was two years old and she was a big fan of milk. (laughs) But we were like, well, you seem to have a dairy sensitivity. And so, guess what? She quit being sick. We don't like to be tested in our brokenness. We don't like to be tested in our fear, our anxiety, our pain. But when we do the testing and we find out where the problem is, now we can address the problem. That was 10, 11 years ago. And guess what? She's super thankful now that we did that because she hasn't been sick for the last 10 years. And as she's grown up, praise God, she's outgrown a lot of those things. And she can do all the eating that she wants to do. But she's aware of the places where she's sensitive. And that's what we're inviting God to do in our life when we say, test me. And know my anxious thoughts. Reveal my fears. This is going to look different for each one of us. But if we begin daily to say, Lord, reveal my fears to me, we can actually start to know what we're afraid of, and then we can do something about it. It's been said that what we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. Let me say that again. What we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. And you'll have to chew on that to see if that makes sense for you. 
But as I spent a lot of time spinning on that this week, I think that it's very accurate. Because sometimes we go into situations where we're scared and instead of trusting that there's a God who loves us and he has our best interests at heart, we protect ourselves, we seek safety, and we avoid those things. I have found that in my life, when I'm willing to step into those moments, not foolishly, not truly like dangerously, but in faith and in boldness, when I step into those moments of fear, God does amazing things because he shows up and I know his presence now. Like there's this concept that like, let's do things so faithful that once it happens, there's no denying that God was involved. Like this thing that we're doing with our building right now. If you looked at our little collection of people and you saw what was happening right now over the last nine years of our church, like if, you, if it was just, look at this room. Like it's not packed with thousands of people. <laughs> we're making a big difference in a lot of people's lives. You know why? Because God is involved in it. His Holy Spirit is guiding it. It's not just based on our own skills and talents and availability. Does he use those things? Absolutely. So test me and know my anxious thoughts. I want you to know it's okay to have fear. Totally okay. It's part of what protects us in life. God has given us fear. Everyone has fear. But when those fears get in the way of our faith, there's a problem. And if God is, one, searching our heart, he's helping me be honest with myself and honest with other people and honest with him, and in that process he begins to uncover my core fears, the things that keep me from really trusting him, that's powerful information. Can't you do something with that? So the follow-up here then is to ask God's Holy Spirit to assist you in your fears. It's okay to be scared, but God's like, I haven't left you or forsaken you. I'm here for you when you're scared. So I want to look at a couple of uh, passages from Scripture. If, you're, if you are taking notes, and, and especially if you're dealing with a lot of pain and anxiety and fear, these passages um, can be very powerful in building you back up. Okay, and so these would be just good for another day in your life. 2 Timothy 1.7. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. It says, for the spirit God gave us, that's his Holy Spirit, the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. You want to go on a whirlwind mental trip? I want you to ask yourself, why does God's power, love, and self-discipline, what does that got to do with timidity and fear? I'm not going to give you that answer today. I want you to chew on that. Power, love, and self-discipline? How do those things help us get through our fear? It's amazing what God can do when, he, when we let him into our lives. Here's another passage that can help you out. I, I've uh, lived in this verse for years of my life, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. If I've ever preached on worry or anxiety, which I've done many times here, you know I'm going to touch on this verse. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, that's a key word, thanksgiving, not the meal we're going to have in a couple of days, but like truly going to God with what am I thankful for, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. How does that deal with my fear? Look at the next verse. It says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does that look like in real life? As I become aware of the fears, the anxieties, and the things that keep me from trusting God, and I don't know how to move through those because they're paralyzing, how do I deal with that? (laughs) I start to make a list of the things I'm thankful for. That's not the full explanation of that passage. I don't want to oversimplify it. But I've done this in my own life. I've helped my kids work through their anxiety with this same exact method make a list of the things you're thankful for because once you begin it's the first few are easy i'm thankful for my house i'm thankful for my family the first three are kind of easy it's hard to get to 10 (laughs) but then once you break that 10 barrier it's like whoa drinkable water is great i'm so thankful for that the air conditioner is working that's fantastic there's lines on the streets that's really helpful for driving like suddenly the world opens up and you're like God is good. By prayer through thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. But it has to begin with me saying, God, reveal my fear. Because I want to trust you with it. Here's one more passage. This is Jesus himself talking about our fear. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, 31 through 34. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. He says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? By the way, these are the, like the most common things we worry about, our physical needs. He says, the pagans run after these things, 
And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough trouble on its own. So, those are some ideas about facing fear. I want you to know it's okay that we have anxieties and fears. We're not meant to tackle them alone. But when we begin to pray this dangerous prayer, search my heart, oh God, test me and know my anxiety, anxious thoughts. From that posture, we can move on uh, to probably the deepest thing that we need to talk about. This is maybe the most dangerous. Verse 24 says this, and see if there's any offensive way in me. What is this talking about? This is talking about our sin. So this is the third line. Uncover my sin. God, uncover my sin. We're real good at covering up our sin. As long as nobody else knows, I can feel good about it. As long as it doesn't get me in trouble at work, mess up my marriage, screw up my finances, I'm fine. I can keep this under control. See if there's any offensive way in me. He has searched our heart. He's exposed our fear. And now the biggest thing that separates us from God is our sin. And we can just say, Lord, is there any way in which I have offended you? That's a different way of praying, isn't it? Lord, is there any way in which I have offended you? And I'm going to guess <laughs> that all of us would be pretty quickly like, yes, there are some things I can think of. Some of this conversation about prayer, and this is very uh, I think relevant to the conversation about prayers is like maybe you've prayed before and you feel like, who am I talking to? There's no answer here. Uh, if, you, if you pray this prayer, Lord, reveal to me any offense I have, uh, I believe God's going to speak to you. It won't be like a booming voice. It might be. That'd be cool. But, but God has gifted you with his Holy Spirit in your life, and sometimes that comes through our conscience. <laughs> sometimes that comes through our, our logic. And we can step in and be like, Yes, there are some ways that I have offended you, Lord. We love to talk the way, about the ways that other people have offended us. We are the most offended culture in history, and it just gets on my nerves. We're, everyone's offended about everything all the time. And uh, I, we should be sensitive. We should care about people. But uh, before we start looking out the window at everybody else, we should look in the mirror and ask ourselves, in what way have I offended my God? I think that's going to deal with a lot of the other offense off the bat. Um, what do we do about our, I talked about how we deal with our fear. What do we do with our sin? Well, we take it to Jesus. That's ultimately what we do with it. And I'll talk about that in a minute as we get into communion. But there's another poem that King David wrote in Psalm chapter 51. I recommend that you bookmark this wherever you bookmark things. Psalm 51 is a prayer that David prayed after he uh, committed adultery and uh, got a lady pregnant and then to cover it up, tried to kill her husband. Actually, he succeeded in that. He's, he's, he died. Um, he had offended a lot of people, <laughs> including his God. And after he comes to his senses and realizes that he has made a really big mistake, this is the prayer he writes. This is Psalm chapter 51. You can read the, the whole thing, uh, and it will really be, I honestly, if you're wrestling with sin and temptation in your life, and you're like, how do I clear it from my brain? I just want to reset. Pray Psalm 51 until you get back on track. I mean, I've done it. Okay, and we're going to focus mainly on chat, uh, verses 10 through 12, but I want to start at the very beginning because this is how prayer starts, uh, David starts his prayer. He says, have mercy on me, O God. That's a good place to start. <laughs> God, how have I offend you, offended you? Whew. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That is a fantastic prayer. He keeps going. For I know my transgressions, and, and my sin is always before me. Against you and against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. We, we have got to be straight up with God and be like, listen, I, I deserve whatever comes from my sin. I messed up. But our God who is full of grace and compassion and love, he doesn't want just punishment for us. Discipline is the process of learning. It's not the process of punishment. That's not what discipline is. Discipline means learning. So he says in verse 10, we skip all the way down to verse 10. So he says, create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me from your presence. 
or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I'm so thankful he wrote this down because that's good stuff. Create in me a pure heart, oh God. Can we just start over? And that's the, that's the promise that Jesus offers when we turn to him in faith. Over and over and over and over again. That's what repentance is, is turning my heart back to God. And that's what grace is. He says, I will forgive you. And I'm going to allow you to continue to walk with me. We're talking about dangerous prayer here. But let's be honest, there are actually not any dangerous prayer. It's just a play on words. When we approach our God with our needs, he is loving. And he will meet those needs in the way that he sees fit. See if there's any offensive way in me. And from that place, we have to go somewhere. We have to know what to do. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's where I want to go with that brokenness, with that sin, with that offense towards God. And God will forgive us. This process, by the way, is called confession. And it's a weighted word because church history has put a lot of angles on confession. But confession is simply this, telling somebody something. <laughs> That's what a confession is, okay? And so you can f- confess things to God, and God His response is forgiveness. And you can also confess things to people. And I have heard that confessing things to people is actually the fastest way to heal. Because sometimes when we talk to God, we're still carrying the weight because our offense was to God, but yes, it was also to someone that we hurt. That's why as spouses, you should communicate even when it's uncomfortable. And so that's confession, and it's going to God, and it's going to people, and it's saying, listen, I I have messed up, but I'm working on this, and I'm asking God to create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me, and I want to do this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And then this last line, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in the way everlasting. The fourth idea is lead me. Lead me, um, I could spend so much time on this point, but it's also pretty straightforward. And so I just want to kind of place that there with you. When you, when you lead someone, or when you, when you let someone lead, this is, this is crucial about leadership. There's like books on leadership, you can go to conferences about leadership. Probably a lot of you fancy yourself leaders, right? And I'm one of them. I'm like, yeah, I'm a leader. But here's the thing, you can only lead someone somewhere where you are also going. Like, hey, follow me to my house, and then I drive somewhere else. I'm not going to get you to my house. We're not going to get there. I'm not leading you to my house. I'm leading you to wherever I'm going. No one can lead you to a place where they're not going. You can't follow me east if I go west. It's impossible. So leading is about helping someone else follow your example, right? That's what leading is. So if you want to get out of the brokenness that you're in, we just talked about show me any ways that I've offended you. If you want to get out of the brokenness that you're in, well, you have to stop following broken people. Who is leading you towards this brokenness? It might be you. That's what the first half of the prayer is about. It might be your influences. Parents, if you want to raise your kids to honor God and have a God-honoring household, you've got to stop raising your kids the way the world says raise your kids. The hottest new psychology or technology is not going to raise your kids to follow the Lord. Only his word will do that. And guess who's responsible for making that happen in your house? You are You can't just drop them off at youth group or Sunday school and hope that they pick up some good things and bring them home. Biblical youth ministry is called parenting. Okay? And so leadership, it's always from the top down. Like you always have to see who's leading who where. And so this last idea like lead me is like this holistic look at like who am I following? (laughs) What are my influences? If you're getting real hot about politics right now, guess what? It's, you're like letting someone else pull your strings. God has a whole different agenda than U.S. politics, right? If you're really, really letting your finances guide you right now, guess who's leading you? The stock market. <laughs> and you could go on and on and on. It's football season. I know some of us get a little too excited about that. Look, that's not what should lead our lives, Lead me in the way everlasting. I mean, we're talking about eternal destinations here, not temporary stuff. Guys, this is dangerous prayer. But I don't know about you, but this is the kind of stuff that I want in my life. 
And it mentally scales to any part of our life, that leadership thing. What's what's happening at work? What's happening at home? What's happening, you know, in your hobbies? Well, who's leading you? Whose example are you following? Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I want to wrap up with this a quick challenge. I already kind of dropped it on you, but uh, I want to encourage you to get an index card. There are index cards in all of the little packets. They're roughly on every other seat. Uh, there's some more at the tables if you want to get them during communion time. And my challenge is that you look up Psalm 139, 23 through 24, and you write it down. <laughs> That's part one of the challenge. My challenge is that you pray it every day this week, every single day. You look at the four lines, and then you stop at each line, and you see what God reveals to you. God's presence in this world is real. His Holy Spirit among us is very real. And if we, if we pray this dangerous prayer, this is just one. Man, to be led in the way everlasting. What more could you want for your life? And we trust him to lead us. Um, that's a dangerous prayer. Well, let's pray it together. Search my heart. Let's go to God right now in prayer.